event today. Hopefully you enjoy the, the ambience and the food. Uh, I know some of you, as you repeat, I think we've got four, four of you in the room who were here 12, literally almost 12 months ago to the day. So uh, we're to, to talk about what we said we would do. Now we're gonna show you what we actually did. And uh, I think hopefully you'll be as excited and, uh, and appreciate the, the opportunity that we see in front of us. Um, so I've got a couple of slides that'll, that'll preset, but just to give you some background from my perspective, Scott Morris, I'm the Vice President of Sales for the Asia, Pacific and uh, Japan business. I was the first employee in, uh, in this part of the world some uh, nearly two years ago, in fact my two year anniversary is coming up in about two months. And, uh, and it was a big geography to, to try and cover on your own, so the better part of the first six months was really just establishing entities, starting to get our hiring and, and partner strategy up and running. So really, in terms of being open for business in Australia, 18 months. So we're, we've got about a year and a half runway that we're gonna talk about. And in that time, we've now moved from employee number one to about 32 people across the region, roughly split 50-50 between Asia and, and ANZ. And what that culminates in is really uh, you know, quite a very broad, still ge geographic coverage, but we can only do that through our partner network. And so for the, the partner community in the room, we're 100% channel focused, not just in this part of the world, but globally. You know, it's a, a fundamental blueprint of our ability to have a relatively small footprint that we extend very uh, capably to, to get that reach. And uh, with that, in particularly in Asia, uh, the necessity to have distribution. Uh, so we have distribution representing us in about 12 countries today that give us that legs and feet on the street to give us that first forward uh, ability to, to start enabling channels, get them certified and tell a very different story that you've been hearing for, for some 18, 20 years. Uh, as we start to think about uh, where we're doing business, we're roughly more than just over, so we're over 100 customers now in this part of the world uh, in 18 months. So. Uh, you know, growing fast, we're seeing we're seeing a year-on-year -year growth rate in in excess of 133 percent, and uh, starting to hit some of the uh, the really core enterprise tier one workloads that you're not seeing from the other so-called type of converged vendors. Everyone's going to spend a uh, a degree of time focusing on where we're differentiating significantly beyond the uh, what we call. Convergence 2.0 players, and you're seeing many, many more of those coming into the marketplace today. None that have the same rich feature set and capability that we bring to the market for enterprise class tier one convergence or hyper convergence, I should say. To give you a sense of, of some referenceability, there are in your packs today um, a number of white papers, and so we've now got trading and, and history now of, of many customers, and I'm not going to steal the wrong thunder in terms of the numbers, but who have bet their business and their tier one enterprise on SimpliVity. Uh, we are now starting to get to the stage of publishing many of those who have made the same leap in, uh, in Australia, New Zealand and across the APJ theatre. Um, the two uh, case studies that I will point you to is Blundstone, so a very iconic Australian brand. Took roughly a rack and a half, nearly two racks of traditional IT infrastructure. First, I think third servers, network switching, storage, SSD arrays, WAN optimization devices, um, cloud uh, appliances, backup software, and the complexity that goes with managing that on a day in day out basis, they were able to replace that with two of our hyper-converged OmniCube devices. They were able to instantiate disaster recovery, which was a, a wish in their previous environment. So they put uh, two of our nodes, if you look on the back of that, that picture, so one and a half racks became for you of, uh, of production equipment in, in their Tasmania data center. They were able to instantiate disaster recovery and business continuity, backup and long range archival and actually increased, were able to increase their RTO and RPO times. Right, so think of our, some of the biggest enterprise customers, how often they're able to back up their environments in production. You're lucky to do that once a day. A, this organization is now taking a, up a, taking a backup every 10 minutes in production and replicating that across site with a reduction in band, WAN bandwidth. So they're able to take their $8,000 a month WAN costs down to $5,000 a month, whilst improving their resiliency and data, data recovery. Three months later, having uh, embedded embedded the, the technology in, are a very willing and, and uh, verbal uh, reference for us, but have now also expanded their, their SimpliVity footprint to include a retail operation out of New Zealand, and a retail operation out of New York, all managed from Tasmania with a single interface being vCenter.
So you know, some, some really interesting use cases that we're seeing from a, from a marketplace. But uh, in terms of, of enterprise class capability, we're seeing tier one banks taking their entire proceeding uh, infrastructure and running 100% on SimpliVity. So yes, that's... Are you like able to uh, name one of those banks? So IDFC Bank in India. Okay. Yeah, so they agreed to be a public reference that was uh, on the cards last year, so great to, to go into that. We see a number of uh, schools. So the other reference that we've got here is, is uh, Bergman School, but we're seeing we've probably got six or seven private institutions who have a very similar uh, you know, capability of disaster recovery, business continuity. Two to 3,000 students that they're looking after, hundreds of staff, trying to do everything from enterprise applications, billing, and your standard general business, to Wi-Fi, managing school environments, dev and test environments. So extremely complicated environments, and this is a very easy and, uh, and effective way for, for those organizations to get a, a very simple infrastructure. Mining oil and gas, so since our, our last conversation, Lou, we've got a mining, mining oil and gas company in New Zealand who uh, have installed and are ready to talk to somebody, so I know that's uh, of interest to you. And we've seen multiple mining sites that are talking to us in real time today for talking about five, six, seven dispersed sites within the Asia Pacific region. And not only that, extending back into some of the uh, exploration sites in the US and, uh, and out into Brazil and other kind of uh, far reaches of, of the globe. We see... Uh, Wait, we have a customer in uh, Switzerland who's one of the 10 largest companies in the world who's also in the mining uh, companies. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Uh, we see those financial services, we have uh, healthcare, so a medical services company, again installed, instantiated out of Australia, sites in Australia, uh, Papua New Guinea, China, Hong Kong, Korea and Singapore, all managing that centrally out of, out of Australia running their core tier one enterprise applications. This is a game changing technology that, uh, that I think we made a lot of promises 12 months ago we have empirical data that is showing you where we are actually taking this to, to real-time market, and it's not a tier two, tier three uh, consolidation of server and storage. We go well beyond that from a data protection, disaster recovery, business continuity, extreme virtualized data performance, our, our ability to dejuke, compress, and optimize data at inception once and forever for the life cycle of the data becomes an absolutely critical component of, uh, of what we bring to a customer. So with that, I'm not going to steal any more of uh, Deron's thunder. So what we have and, uh, and are able to share with you today, research that I only got yesterday, so we've been working on some research specific to the, uh, the ANZ marketplace around the state of hyperconvergence. And so first time, in fact, that Deron's seen this data and, uh, and many others. So Actual Tech Media, uh, we partnered with this organization to go and take a, uh, a group of, of uh, organizations, so 160 from APJ, of which 124 were specifically out of the ANZ marketplace. So when you look at this research, you'll be able to get a sense of not just the, the APJ centric, but specifically you know, where ANZ is sitting in our view around uh, where they see hyperconvergence. So small or large, so 100 to, to 1,000 seat uh, employees an enterprise of a thousand and beyond. So not just the small organizations, we're definitely pointing this and making sure that we're referencing the data points of, uh, of the enterprise sector. So interestingly enough, as you start to think about the biggest challenges that the IT professionals in our marketplace are today, if you look at the, uh, the top four or top five, we're not seeing much, we did this survey also in the US. So we're not seeing much variation from that. The order may change, but ultimately we're talking about improving operational efficiency Managing your data growth, it's a massive concern for global. We're talking four uh, zettabytes to, for, to 40 zettabytes by 2020. Right? And that's, we've only got five years to go or four years to go until that mark. Exponential growth of data that just is almost unmanageable in traditional environments. Data, data center consolidation, and you'll hear some, uh, some very interesting news on some wins we've had globally in that space. But automation and orchestration, you know, none of these I think are new to, to you. But also, very clearly, you know, fourth on this list at 27%, improving DR, DR and, and business continuity. I won't go further, you know, next one, next most before we kind of drop down below 25%, you know, improving data and backup. So if you kind of think of those top five or six as the core challenges of today's uh, IT market. Before you move on from that, Scott, yeah. I'm just curious that the word security appears nowhere there. Yeah. And that used to be kind of 
few years ago, that's you know, top three, top two. Yeah. <coughs> I think it's probably still top one, top three. Right? Yeah, I was about to say that's the kind of problem. Probably not for that option. Probably so the so specific so element is really that operation. So this is risk yeah. management. When I speak yeah. with CAO security, it's still very high in my mind. It's not good for it. Right, so this was specific to their this perception and where they would see hyperconvergence and, and exactly, how and what exactly. would what's their perception or challenges yeah, yeah. in the IT priorities of exactly. operational so perspective or correct. Yeah. So when you look at that, so this is 124 respondents specifically in ANZ. When you then look at that in terms of what's on your on my sorry right hand side, you know, what's your plans to adopt? So we're looking at adoption rates. You've seen a lot of new entrants into the marketplace. 60% said yes. In the next two years, we're going to adopt some form of hyperconvergence. And when you kind of split this graph here, one to two years, 51%, but literally 50% are gonna be doing this in the next three to three to 12 months. So definitely starting to see some mainstream view of where hyperconvergence is gonna play a part in this, uh, in this space. All right, when they think, when you then ask the question, right, so you're gonna go down this path, what do you expect to get out of it when you get there? And the, uh, the top three uh, issues that really come up, maybe down to the fourth, but improve again, operational efficiency, reduce my cost significantly, accelerate my deployment time, and reduce my inter infrastructure task time. And of course, you know, various savings and how much savings that they think they will get. Here's the good news. So we conducted a research uh, piece with IDC, which we released I think two, two months ago, Jordan, yep. and uh, we can make that available to you for, for download. But here's what we, we surveyed 180 customers globally, 50% from the Americas, 35% from Europe, and the remaining 15 came out of the emerging markets of, of APJ and, uh, and uh, other emerging markets. And here's the savings that that 138, these are SimpliVity customers in play today that have all been surveyed. The most interesting side, so this is area of improvement, uh, who said of this 180 people survey, who saw an improvement in the various categories? So this is the degree of people who said, yes, I've got significant improvement. The axis down here says, what percentage improvement did you get in that subsequent category? And what is fundamentally game-changing with SimpliVity and SimpliVity technology is that I would be proud in a proceed any preceding organisation to say, I'm going to give you 30% savings on any category, let alone 50% or a minimum of 40% is our minimum to as much as 70% across all categories. And this is the defining and differentiating element that SimpliVity brings to this market that no other hyperconverged vendor or other traditional vendor is able to provide today. So with that prelude, I've set up for Duron to show you how, why, and where we see the future of this going. But thank you very much for your attendance today. Very much appreciate your uh, focus and, and attention on our, our business. I'm excited. We've got a lot of growth to come out of this and, and you haven't seen anything yet. So uh, watch this space.